Today at the New Indian, we have with us Mr. Umesh Muramudali. He is an expert on economics, and he is also being a Shevening scholar. Welcome to Reason, the New Indian's platform where we get to the reason of the issues that concern you. Welcome, Muramudali. Hi, 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 Arti. It's a pleasure to be uh, on the show. Uh, so uh, we will uh, begin this conversation with the most obvious question: What is the status of Sri Lanka economically today? We know that uh, Sri Lanka has gone through a very turbulent crisis. Uh, it has, you know, failed uh, on uh, its economic front completely. There is a complete collapse and chaos. We see it on the streets. Tell us what is the current status. So, um, the currently, Sri Lanka is in the process of uh, seeking a loan from the IMF. Uh, if you go to the origin of the crisis, that is largely because Sri Lanka's poor economic management. That's two fronts. One, uh, there's a huge budget deficit. Government spend more than it could and didn't raise enough revenue. And then the the most burning issue at hand is that uh, the country doesn't have foreign currency either to import essentials or to uh, or to repay the foreign loans so that is why we defaulted foreign loans on april so that that we are no longer paying foreign loans but even then uh, we are really struggling to manage our uh, imports because we don't we literally don't have foreign currencies in the country so we, we are barely managing uh, you know the full ship by ship basis can you explain it for our viewers that how did Sri Lanka arrive at the stage where it had no foreign currency reserves? A lot of people say that uh, it's because of the China's debt trap. Is that correct? Would you say that it is because of uh, Sri Lanka-Chinese trade relationship or economic relationship that has reduced this catastrophe? Uh, that, is, that is an entirely uh, incorrect interpretation of the issue because uh, China is only one creditor for Sri Lanka. So let me go back how we end up in this crisis. So so China is only part of the problem that is that is really not the issue at hand in Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka traditionally has had a problem of uh, having more imports than exports. So that that really means that uh, you your country doesn't have enough foreign currency in general. So every year you have to borrow. So we used to borrow from international capital markets, what we call international sovereign bonds and which are really depending on your credit ratings. So what happened in 2019 when Gotabe Rajapaksha came into power, uh, he gave a series of tax cuts, which resulted in a significant credit rating downgrade. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we also see the COVID. So because of the COVID, Sri Lanka's tourism revenue had a substantial impact. So that means that the foreign currency inflows to the country reduced uh, substantially by about uh, three to four billion U.S. dollars. That I know that that may sound a very small amount to India, but that is a that is around 25% of Sri Lanka's foreign currency earning on annual basis. So by 2020, mid 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 of 2020, Sri Lanka has the problem of okay, so we we don't have enough foreign currency reserves, but at the same time, Sri Lanka can't go and borrow from international capital markets also because our credit ratings have significantly dropped because the, you know the international banks will not give you money. If you uh, if you really don't have a good credit rating, so at that point the the option for the government was uh, okay acknowledge that we don't we can't keep repaying the loans, uh, we will restructure the debt at this point so that we have enough foreign currency reserves to finance our essential imports, right? But they went the other way. They decided no, we are keep going to repay the loans and use all the existing foreign currency reserves uh, for about two years. Uh, to repay the loans consistently by 2020 March, because all the reserves you had, you mostly have used for used to repay the foreign loans. That is largely uh, uh, the loans obtained from the international capital markets. Then uh, that resulted in Sri Lanka really running out of foreign currency reserves. So to put the China's picture on the perspective, out of the foreign loan repayments, only about 20% are to China. Uh, Almost 50% of Sri Lanka's foreign currency repayments during last two years uh, were to international sovereign bonds, what you in internationally call euro bonds, from what you have borrowed from international capital markets. So, so that is that is the biggest issue because those loans are at higher interest rates. 
uh, and also those loans has a maturity structure which resulted in a significant foreign currency outflow at one go. So that really puts pressure on your foreign currency situation. I think that was uh, Sri Lanka wasn't quite ready. I'm not saying that uh, essentially these capital market borrowings are uh, really bad, but it's that your economy has to be strong enough to absorb the risk. And Sri Lankan economy really wasn't because Sri Lanka did not do the macroeconomic uh, reforms or the changes that the country was supposed to do. So in a way, you are directly blaming the Rajapaksas, which is the popular view in Sri Lanka. Um, to the to this particular crisis, this magnitude of the crisis, yes, because uh, this this was this crisis was looming. It was inevitable that Sri Lanka would face a risk of sovereign default and something along these lines. Uh, you can't say it wasn't looming, but the the the. The magnitude of the crisis, people dying on the fuel queues, people waiting in the fuel queues for days and having power cut for 10 to 12 hours, not having medicine and people really having at, uh, living at the risk of dying without medicine. Things wouldn't have been this bad if Rajapaksha's managed the economy better because by the time they took over in 2019, economy was vulnerable and fragile. So when you are dealing with such a situation, you need to be cautious. But they were not cautious. They really, they completely ignored how bad the situation is uh, and then took these decisions. But uh, the the underlying factors of uh, this default or underlying factors of this economic collapse was there for four decades, largely because Sri Lanka didn't have enough tax revenue. Sri Lanka didn't have enough exports. And Sri Lanka was traditionally a twin deficit country, which means we, ex we import more than we export and our our government expenditure is a lot higher than the government revenue. That really means that you keep borrowing from foreign creditors to bridge that gap. So that has been happening for decades, right? So that was so that was the the underlying reasons. But uh, the Rajapaksha's made it really uh, getting it this this magnitude. Uh, there is a piece uh, in New York Times uh, which has been written by Indrajit Samarajiva. And I want to quote from this piece because I think uh, it brings in a perspective which is not uh, quite widespread. It says that um, basically Sri Lanka collapsed first, but it won't be the last. And he attributes it to the uh, West Western debt-fueled colonization. Is basically saying that the Western dominated neoliberal system that keeps developing countries in a form of debt fueled colonization. The system is in crisis, its shaky foundations exposed by the tumbling dominoes of the Ukraine war, resulting in food and fuel scarcity, the pandemic, and looming insolvency and hunger rippling across the world. So the Blame is basically on the Western neoliberalism. Would you agree with that? I'm not really totally agreeing with uh, Indi on uh, many opinions, but there, there's, uh, there's uh, some part of it is true in the sense that uh, uh, Sri Lanka and many other countries uh, over relied on uh, global financiers in the sense that the global banks in the form of issuing Euro bonds or any other the capital flows. But uh, what I personally believe is that these are the choices that the countries made uh, to go to this uh, the, go to these global financiers or to go to China. This is this one problem I find with those who accuse China or those who accuse other other institutions because the decisions at the end of the day are made in Sri Lanka by Sri Lankan Parliament, Sri Lankan leaders. And they were not really responsible. They were not really, you know, taking responsibility for what they were making decisions for. Because, for example, China didn't really force Sri Lanka to take loans. Sri Lanka decided to use China to, you know, their political purposes or to to fuel the economic growth. So I think, I think a country, not only Sri Lanka but many developing nations, need to be cautious in their uh, public finance management where they can borrow and make sure that you are st your economy is strong enough to borrow and not to go over-reliant or overboard with these borrowings. I know there's this narrative which sometimes is quite catchy to uh, put the blame on neoliberalism or the West. But I personally think that we could, yes, we could blame the West today, but 
what are we going to do if we face this crisis next again in another 10 or 20 years because if you don't fix your public finance issues if you don't have transparency in public finance uh, management or if you if your parliament is not really answerable and they are not really doing what it needs to do uh, then we're going to be facing this issue again in another decade or two then we could go the full cycle again blaming the west blaming the china or someone else rather than us taking the the responsibility what could rajapaksas have done differently or what could have uh, sri lanka done differently in the last say 30 40 years when they started you know borrowing from the west then they started borrowing from china and uh, then uh, at the same time were cutting down their own taxes so what could rajapaksas or what could sri lanka have done differently i i mean to start it i keep going back to the issue of tax revenue because that is i personally believe as a fundamental cause of this crisis uh, if i may give like a figure in two th- in, two, in 1990 sri lanka's tax uh, collection was 20% of its gdp this came down to around 10% in 2015 now it's at 7.7% and more and if you go back and look like who are the people who are not paying taxes it's actually the rich the companies are not paying enough taxes high income earners like professionals or the the those with inherited wealth are not paying enough taxes so th- they are because they are not paying enough taxes a lot of taxes are collected from the poor by the way of indirect taxes uh, such as uh, taxes on imports um etc so uh, that when you don't have enough tax revenue what it eventually leads to is to borrowing and that escalates the problem further if you want to borrow for infrastructure development and etc so what they would have done differently is actually had a better tax policy and tax administration since from back then if you actually take a look at countries who who graduated from uh, lower income level to high income levels you will see that those countries have good mechanism to collect taxes and they have collect enough taxes and uh, put enough direct taxes particularly taxes on income is higher so that is that is one thing i would i would think that they should have done differently secondly that the exports uh, sri lanka uh, sri lanka really didn't focus on improving exports or diversifying country's exports over last 2 uh, to 3 decades and uh, that if you go and see that is a fundamental problem because all these uh, difficulties pertaining to repaying foreign loans boils down to the fact that sri lanka doesn't have enough uh, exports so how what you could have done differently to increase exports focus on those sectors what you see is the the foreign direct investments even come into sri lanka or the sectors that drove sri lanka's growth were non tradable sectors like construction uh, wholesale and retail insurance or banking there's been a significant expansion of the the banking finance and insurance sector in the country as well so so those sectors doesn't really also the real estate sector those sectors doesn't really add much value to an export economy and if you don't develop an export economy based on production which you can export to the other countries may that be india china or whatever uh, then you are prone to fail so i think if they had focused a lot more instead of rent seeking there's been massive amount of rent seeking businesses in sri lanka so that's how the money has been made so you see you see they make money through rent seeking without much productive activity and then even from the money that you uh, raise from that also you don't pay tax and then what you do is using that so, money you imp- there was a time when uh, we used to read reports on how sri lanka's uh, textile manufacturing she was doing very well uh, the west was actually being stitched uh, in sri lanka um, big brands you know uh, lingerie brands were actually manufacturing their products in sri lanka we at the same time were reading reports of the booming you know tourism we uh, had you know everybody uh, who had uh, middle income you know background in in fact asia was looking towards sri lanka for a vacation 
then with all these uh, you know things going on you see that rent seeking became the main instrument or became the mo- main characteristics of the trade with sri lanka or in sri lanka Uh, can you please explain what really happened how is it that you know with all these things going on you saying that it was essentially rent seeking let's go back for a couple of decades and try to see what exactly happened yes we started textile factories uh, late 80s early 90s these were with the either foreign direct investment or investment in the 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 specialized free trade zone areas right so this was good as a start at that point uh, we are still producing these uh, uh, laundry you know, laundry via you know the undergarments in particular for the global brands but that is not really sufficient because uh, where, where we went wrong is yes these these companies do make money and if we if you take a look at sri lanka's uh, uh, sri lanka's out of sri lanka's export revenue um around 50% actually comes from the apparel so that is still there but the problem has been the further expansion of the industry uh did not happen because you can't expect further expansion largely because you are in a very globally competitive market you are competing with bangladesh vietnam kenya ethiopia india lot of other countries uh, which have lower wages than sri lanka so you can't compete on a cost basis right so so you do well only up to a certain level then you need the the diversification of exports which didn't really happen in sri lanka and that's where the the rent seeking uh, comes from so sri lanka didn't really diversify its exports sufficiently and uh, most people saw that they could make money easily through rent seeking because on su- on some items there were significant taxes on imports and also there was significant government involvement as well so you could actually purchase from the government at a lower cost some items and sell to the market and some items you sell at a higher price to the government through the connections uh, uh, not having enough transparency etc so 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 lot of businesses made money this way because this was easy right this was easy you don't have to put the hard work of uh, uh, building efficiency and trying to comp- compete at global level etc etc so that didn't happen because that was easy money and then there was a significant amount of political class that also get engaged with the business community at different levels so that was that was a relationship that benefited both parties right so so that's one of the reasons why rent seeking businesses continue to uh, grow for example if you take a look at the the real estate industry in sri lanka Uh, that doesn't really add much value but you see it's an easy business to do there's speculation in the land market uh, and as you see some highways or expressways being developed uh, automatically the land value is going up because not because that there's any real value of the land but uh, because it's the, the, the dynamics have changed so because because it's easy people got into that and the politics also uh, facilitated that so but they didn't see that their vision was short term because in short term you could make money and you could make a, a lot of money and because uh, because the money was made they didn't really care or listen uh, about the danger of tr- country running into a crisis about tourism yes we've been doing well uh, in tourism uh, but it's the covid that hit and uh, and the i think tourism industry will keep growing after the recovery because the sri lanka has all the infrastructure in place to to be a good tourist hub uh, but i personally don't think that tourism industry alone would be sufficient because that is a service driven industry that also could sometimes be vulnerable to global shocks you know uh, if uh, if people suddenly decided there's more going to thailand or other countries or if there's like another global crisis that could really affect uh your industry so it's not really a very very stable way of uh, generating foreign currency inflows uh it's important that we rebuild it and keep it as one of the major sources of our foreign currency income but uh, we need uh, more stable foreign currency inflows particularly through the the exports the value chains probably logistics uh, stuff like that what is 
path of recovery is there any path of recovery where sri lanka can be self sustainable and self reliant do you feel that this uh, imf agreement that sri lanka has done it is the path to recovery imf agreement is uh, it is the minimum requirement at this moment uh, not only because of money but imf at this point gives credibility to sri lanka because uh, the way in which we have managed our public finances Uh, those creditors, whether we like it or not, we'll have to deal with the foreign creditors now uh, and come to a solution. And then we'll have to deal with other countries as well, Japan, China, India, all of them. All those countries will have concerns and also they will not support if there's no credibility from Sri Lankan front. So the credibility actually comes to an IMF program because if Sri Lanka, when Sri Lanka goes to an IMF program, Sri Lanka make uh, certain commitments. Uh, to say that okay we will not be engaged in uh un- you know the excessive borrowings we will increase our tax revenue so those commitments are important because if there's no assurance other countries also will not have. that's why i say it's a it's a precondition for the for the recovery but the recovery itself is going to be difficult uh, because we are in a crisis and the economic growth rate is already negative and raising taxes in a context like that is extremely difficult so the the choices available are very difficult we all we last week we saw electricity prices have uh, prices were increased and uh, we see significant rise of cost of living and on top of that uh, there was a significant interest rate hike uh, to to tackle the inflation and now um, in soon you will see further tax increases as well so these are not easy reforms that sri lanka will have to do so every, everybody like everyone from different classes will have to uh, come together and make certain sacrifices uh, so the, those sacrifices need to come more from those who are on the top uh, because they they have more capacity to pay taxes in particular uh, and also reduce the consumption in particular because their reduction of consumption could be reducing the number of parties you are having per week or something along those lines rather than cutting your meals from having three meals per day to two meals per day right so so that is it is important that the rich at the top understands this dynamic because if they don't make that sacrifice that could lead to a social unrest because if you see people in people in the bottom of the pyramid making a sacrifice their sacrifice would be from having three meals a day going to one meal a day that could really uh, create public agitation social unrest so on and so forth you know uh, and that risk is there so the, that risk can be eliminated through reforms and to carry out those reforms you need the 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 top income earners to compromise the one of the suggestions is to increase the highest tax rate to 32% right so it's important that people pay this 32% and it might actually have to go higher in short term to raise more tax revenue and i think those people actually can pay is ranil vikram singh government uh, doing that are they on that path are they actually uh, whipping and cracking down on the top income earners in sri lanka uh, right so so um, the proposals have been made uh, because this is this is not a not not something that ranil alone can decide or the government can decide because they are really stuck because imf will push the reform of having higher taxes having the tax reforms and without which imf will not actually come in, enter into an agreement so the government at this point doesn't really have a choice per se uh, and what have they done so far they have made certain proposals that the tax rates will be increased but we still haven't seen the legislation so we will have to see in hopefully in coming month or so you will see the legislation coming out how this is going to be uh, carried out uh, but uh, so far it seems that some commitments will be made but you'll have to wait and see how this will be uh, carried out well thank you so much for being with us today we will probably have another conversation uh, after a month or so to see if the ranil vikram singh government is on the path of reforms these are the economy of sri lanka thank you so much thank you arti thank you